great pleasure to be part of this uh, program, this program called uh, uh, Kapi During the Quarantine. And things have, since last year, have uh, things have improved so much that we should be calling this uh, Kapi During Quasi-Quarantine. Uh, things are looking up better. So that is one fearful news amidst all these uh, negative things happening around us. So on behalf of uh, International Center for Theoretical Sciences and Jawaharlal Nehru Planetarium, uh, Bengaluru, I take this opportunity to extend a very, very warm welcome, first of all, to the uh, speaker of the day, uh, Professor Geeta Venkatraman, who has uh, lined up a very interesting topic the art and science of secret messages, some glimpses. Uh, the topic itself is very inviting and uh, I'm sure you, we will all be glued to this uh, to the end of the talk. And uh, I would also like to extend a warm welcome to the audience who have joined us on uh, various uh, uh, platforms, uh, YouTube, uh, Zoom and uh, other virtual platforms. So thank you very much for being very supportive of this uh, program uh, even during uh, these pandemic times and that has given us enormous energy and encouragement to go on with uh, the, uh, these interesting uh, series of lectures. So now I request uh, Professor Rukmini Day uh, to take over and continue the proceedings. Thank you all and have a good day. Uh, a hearty welcome to all of you for uh, this KDK event where we have Professor Geeta Venkataraman from Ambedkar University, Delhi. Uh, she did her PhD in University of Oxford. Uh, she, her work centered around group theory, uh, specifically enumeration of finite groups. She still works on uh, finite group theory and relative, re related areas. Uh, she is also very interested in popularization of mathematics and undergraduate education and issues of women in mathematics. Uh, and she's also very interested in bird watching. So Gita, a warm welcome to you. And we really look forward to uh, your topic, the art and science of secret messages, some glimpses. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rukmini. And uh, thanks for asking me to, to participate in this uh, event. Um, I think we had uh, started our conversations related to this while it was still a physical event, but I'm so glad that I'm able to, to do this. Um, I just wanted to say that um, I've tried to, given that the audience is going to be very varied, I've tried to keep the mathematical content uh, um, at, of, a, of a level where I think most people will be able to, uh, to understand how the mathematics is being used in, um, in creating and uh, transmitting secret messages. Um, however, I mean, uh, I, I, if there are mathematicians in the audience, I have to ask their pardon because I'm, I'm going to do quite a bit of hand waving because there are things which uh, I'm not going to um, go very deep into the mathematical background of, but try and give an intuitive idea of how things work. So um, I, I, apologies to the mathematicians in the audience and to everyone else. I hope uh, you will find that the mathematical content is of a level where you can enjoy it. And um, so... Um, and, and the whole idea here is that you leave feeling uh, the math, magic of mathematics and how it, uh, it actually plays a role in, um, in our everyday life, really. I mean, um, as you can see on the cover, I've, I've put uh, the picture of a credit card as well as uh, WhatsApp messages. And somewhere during the talk, I'll tell you how that's connected to our uh, topic of the day, which is basically on uh, ciphers and encryption. So I'm just going to uh, start with my slides. Um, in case somebody is uh, uh, needs to ask a question related to what I'm showing on the slides, I think on Zoom, you can use the chat option and then 
maybe Anupam, uh, who's part of the outreach team, will keep track of it. And if it's urgent, he can interrupt me and ask me about it. And similarly, if you're watching on, uh, on the YouTube live stream, there too, you can put up your questions. Uh, towards the end of the talk, of course, there is a session where I'll handle uh, any of the questions that you may have about the talk. So let's start with um, what I call the art and science of secret messages, some glimpses. Um, so let's... So I'm going to start with um, the area which, which deals with this, which is called cryptography. And uh, cryptography um, is derived from the Greek word cryptos, which means hidden, and graphia, which means writing. So literally cryptography means the art of hidden or secret writing, okay? And before, I tell you about cryptography, a little bit of the history, how, you know, about the encryption methods that were used and so on. I need to tell you a little bit about some technical terms that we will be using through the talk. So um, the main idea here, of course, is that you want to encrypt or make your message secret in such a way that even if that message falls into the hands of an enemy, it's impossible for that person to understand the message. However, the person who's supposed to receive the message, the encrypted message, should be able to recover the original message from the secret form or the encrypted form that it has been sent in. So that's the main idea that we'll be exploring. And uh, so some terminology that I will use. So plain text will be the message that you want to send. That is the message which you've written before you have made it secret or before you encrypted it. And once you've encrypted that message, then we will call it cipher text. And encryption is the process by which you're going to convert the plain text message to cipher text. And decryption is the met method by which the recipient converts the cipher text back to plain text. Okay. So some history. So this was a, a picture that I had on my opening screen. It's called a Spartan sky tail. And it uh, dates back to the fifth century before Christ, uh, before the Christian era or the common era as it's known now. Um, and it was considered to be one of the first ever military cryptographic devices. So how did this work? So, uh, so the, the sky tail is just a wooden rod and um, you have a leather strip on which you write down your message and then uh, you roll it on the sky tail. Actually, okay, so the leather strip is rolled on the sky tail first and then you write your message horizontally on that leather strip so here's a here's a uh, um, you know here's how you would do it so this is a, a digital version of a sky tail and uh, as you can see there's a leather strip which has been wound around the sky tail and uh, it's uh, uh, horizontally on it we've written help me at once now. And then when you unwrap the leather strip, when you unwind it, then the text looks like this. So it looks like H-E-C-E-A-E-L-T-N-P-O-O-M-N-W. So the plain text message here is help me at once now. And then when you have unwound the leather strip, from the sky tail and you just read what is written on the um, leather strip, it, it reads like this, this is your cipher text. And so what would happen is that um, in, in, during war, when they had to exchange messages, all the people in one particular army to whom the messages had to be exchanged would all have the same wooden rod distributed before the war. 
and then when they uh, had to send a message it would be written in this way and the leather strip would be carried by a soldier who would take it from um, the person who has sent it to the person who is supposed to receive it and if the enemy intercepts that message all they're going to see is the cipher text and they won't be able to recover the original um, text original plain text unless they also had a wooden rod of the exact same dimension so in this way uh, secret messages could be sent and even if they were intercepted they could not be deciphered by the enemy so as i mentioned only rewinding the strip around another side tail of the same size shape etc will reveal the original message so this was one of the oldest uh, cryptographic uh, devices and uh, uh, encryption methods that were used the next example that i'm going to talk about it's called the caesar shift cipher or rolling code and uh, it's named caesar shift cipher because it was supposed to have been used by caesar so in this what happens is that so whichever language the the letters that you have in your language that's your plain text alphabet and then what you do is you move the letters a certain number of places without changing the order so uh, in this case what we've done is we've shifted everything three places so the cipher text alphabet now becomes d e f g h i and so on and um, if you look at um, a plain text message help it will be when you convert it to cipher text because h has become k and e has become h and you can see that l is o and p will turn out to be s so that cipher text which is created is cos so that's what is transmitted and uh, anyone in intercepting it has to figure out you know what cos actually stands for and they wouldn't normally know uh, what it means okay so here the cipher alphabet is created by shifting or rolling the plain alphabet by a certain number of places and it's three in the above example i mean in the english uh, alphabet you have 26 letters so um i mean the maximum you can shift things to is so if you shift it by 25 then um, i mean that's the amount you would get the 26 shift would keep it as it, same as it is okay, so if you want to recover the plain text so you have to shift back your cipher text alphabet by three places and then figure out what would be the plain text corresponding to the letters and that's how you can get your original thing back now um on my facebook account and maybe on some of the social media accounts i had given two ciphers to crack and one of them was a caesar ship cipher or rolling code i, I need to say one thing here if i just give an encrypted message without really saying um you know what has been used to encrypt it then it's very very difficult to decrypt it um it's not a fair game at all and uh, if you want to be able to crack something like that you really need to have a lot of text which has been encrypted and then you can do some kind of a language analysis uh you know so if you know that the the encrypted uh, message has been uh, the plain text was written in english and then you can do an analysis to find out which letter it is representing e if it is a, a substitution a cipher like this you know so but if you actually do not know what the encryption method is then it's very it's quite difficult to actually solve or find out what uh, the encrypted message is um so the first thing you actually have to do when you when you uh, have an encrypted message is to take a take some kind of an informed guess on what kind of encryption was used but in my post i had actually said the types of encryption that i had used so the uh, the 
post that I made was the cipher text was given as YKK, EU, AG, ZZ, NK, ZGRQ. And I actually did have someone post uh, an answer to this on, on my Facebook uh, account. And uh, so what was the plain text? And here you have to do a trial and error, right? I mean, uh, you, uh, in a Caesar shift code, you, you have to shift by a certain number of places and then you have to figure out which number of places when you shift will you actually, will this actually make sense? And in this case, I had shifted it by six places. And uh, so the, the ciphertext alphabet A went to G, B. If you think of A as one and uh, G as seven, it's like adding six to the place where each uh, letter is of the alphabet is. So uh, the plain text was S-E-E-Y-O-U-A-T-T-H-E-T-A-L-K and which you can easily see is C at the top. So I'm uh, hopefully some of you uh, did manage to uh, take a look at this cipher text and um, also manage to crack it. The next one was a little bit more difficult. Um, it's a slightly different type of uh, cipher. So in the previous one, in the Caesar cipher, what you saw is each letter was being replaced by another letter, but in a, in a, in a pattern, which was, you know, in the first example, moving three places, and in the second example, moving six places. This one is, is what is called a transposition uh, cipher. Basically here, what you do is you have a, a way in which you jumble the letters. So it's not like A is, um, you know, it's, it's a bit like the, uh, the first example that you had, which was that the original message helped me at once was jumbled into another sequence of letters using the sky tail. So the rail fence cipher is a bit like that. Um, so I'm, I'm doing a version of it. So in the plain text, again, I've taken this, uh, the same one that we looked at previously. It is CU at the top. And what I've done is I've colored the alternate letters in a different uh, color. So uh, the rail fence cipher is also called a zigzag cipher. And basically what you do is, that, um, uh, I mean, it, it depends on, in this particular version, your, your gray colored things would step down diagonally from their place to a line below. And then you write all the letters of the first line together. And after that, the letters of the second line. Here I've colored it in two different colors. So the cipher text will be write all the brown colored letters first and then all the gray colored letters. Okay, so the encrypted message now is S-C-O-A-T-E-A-K-E-Y-U-T-H-T-L. And, uh, uh, and, and of course, it, that was the cipher text of the plain text, see you at the talk. Now in the, in the Facebook page and in, in social media, uh, which was posted by ICTS, this was the other cipher text given and uh, people were told that this was a rail fence cipher. So if you're given a cipher text and you're told it's a rail, a rail fence cipher, um, how do you crack it? So you can see that the, in the earlier example, the way we created the cipher text was half of, you know, I mean, if you look at, if you count the number of letters, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then you had uh, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So there were 15 letters in all. And basically, so the cipher text needs to be split in uh, almost two halves. The first part is slightly larger. So I have eight letters here and seven letters here. And then you just start inserting the letters here in between the other ones. So here, if you count, there are uh, 22 letters. And the question is, you'll either split it as 11 and 11 or 12 and 10. 
And actually the 12 and 10 works here. And what you'll see is that uh, if I take the first 12 letters and then the next 10 letters, I color it differently. And then I insert it uh, in between as we did in the reverse direction in the first example. You get this as the plain text and you can see it's saying crack this, then learn more. Okay, so um, this is one example of another cipher called the rail fence or the zigzag cipher. Uh, so now I've given you a few examples and what I want us to do is to step back from the examples and think about what does the encryption process involve? And um, so I'm going to take you through that. And once we, and you'll, we'll also see how these, in these examples, what are the different parts? Okay, so. Uh, excuse me, Professor yeah. Gita, there's a quick question by Sam. Why yeah. is it called a rail fence cipher? Yeah, so uh, see, the thing is, if you actually uh, do it not the way I did, which is I just colored the alternate letters, but. Um, the rail fences in the place where I guess this was, uh, that's how the name came up, they were zigzag, okay? So think of a, uh, you know, a series of uh, uh, Vs joined. And so you're writing your plain text on the top and then the things in between move down. And actually I have only created a cipher in which we, it moved down uh, one of the letters moved down, it, it was colored differently, but you can have a rail fence cipher where uh, the third letter is also colored differently and it actually goes even lower. So it's like the, the letters move along that V in a way. And, and then you're reading off the lines and they are becoming your cipher text. So that's the reason why it's called rail fence because apparently it's, it's going along those zigzag rails. Um, that's the explanation that's given. But the way I have done it, it doesn't look zigzag at all. I didn't make the letters move down. Um, but instead of coloring, you can do that, right? So instead of C, U, uh, I, I had S on top, then E could have moved down. Then the next letter stays up. The fourth letter comes down. The fifth letter stays up. And so you have a zigzag pattern. And so it's like uh, uh, rails along uh, rail fences. That, that's the explanation at least I discovered when I was also, this, this, this uh, um, you know, immediately struck me too as to why is it being called rail fence? Presumably somewhere the, the rails are placed in that manner. Thank you. Thank you. So coming back to this, every encryption system has two parts. Okay? So there's something called the algorithm and something called the key. And I'll explain what each of these is. So the algorithm is basically the encryption method. So let's look at the three examples that we had and figure out what was the encryption method. So the Spartan Skytail that we used in the first thing, the algorithm here is wrap the strip of leather around the Skytail and write message horizontally. So that was the algorithm which was there for the encryption. For the Caesar shift cipher, the algorithm is shift the plain text alphabet by a certain number of places. In the two examples that we saw earlier, we uh, the first example, it's the, the um, plain text alphabet was shifted by three places. And in the uh, second case, it was shifted by six places. Okay? And the third example is the rail fence cipher. The algorithm here is to write some specified letters of the plain text in a different color and then to write the new message as color one followed by color two, the, the cipher text message. Okay, so, so see, so algorithm is the general method that is being used. And the key actually tells you the precise way in which that encryption method has been applied. So it's 
for each encryption, the key will can change, even though the method might remain the same. So in the Spartan Skytail, the key is actually the specific Skytail used. So if I change the Skytail, say I make it fatter and, and more rounder, then if I write the same message around the same leather strip wound uh, on the Skytail, the message will, the, the cipher text will be different from what we had earlier. Similarly, in the Caesar shift cipher, the number of places that you shift the plain text alphabet will give you different cipher texts. Okay, so the key in the first example was three and the key in the second example was six. And uh, in, in, um, in this cipher, in Caesar shift, shift cipher, uh, when we are looking at the English alphabet, you can have 26 keys. Okay, one of which will actually keep the message as it is, right? But that's the maximum number of keys that are possible. And in the rail fence cipher, again, the key here specifies which letters are going to get colored. So let's continue with examining our encryption systems. As we saw, there's two parts, the algorithm and the key. And so you can think of the schema for encryption as follows. So uh, you're putting in, so think of the algorithm as, as a black box, which is just applying a method. And you have to give in two inputs. You have to put in the plain text and the encryption key and the black box churns out your cipher text. Similarly, if you look at the decryption schema, again, uh, you have uh, the algorithm, which will, the general method by which we decrypt. But again, there's a decryption key that gets put in and the cipher text gets put in and the output is the plain text. The three examples that we looked at, if you think a little bit about it, the decryption key essentially is the opposite or the inverse of the uh, encryption key or it is exactly the same. So in the case of the Spartan Cytel, uh, the encryption and the decryption key were the same. It was the same Cytel, right? And um, when you do the, see, so the encryption and decryption, the crucial role is played by the key. The algorithm is assumed to be known and is kind of standard. As I said, if you don't even know the algorithm or the which method of encryption is was used, it's going to be very, very difficult to crack any encryption system any encryption that you're faced with. So the robustness depends on the key and here comes the problem. So your encryption key, as we saw in the Spartan Skytail involved, it was the same. Encryption and decryption key was the same. It was that wooden rod. So the person encrypting and the person decrypting both had to have the exact same wooden rod so uh, in a warlike scenario, the wooden rods were distributed, say, beforehand. And, uh, and then during the war, they could use it. Okay? In the Caesar cipher, you can see that to, to encrypt, we moved the plain text alphabet by three places. To decrypt, we moved back by three places. Right. So if you think of numbers being associated with the positions that the letters occupy, then to find out uh, what the cipher text uh, number is, uh, letter is, you just had to add three. So A was in the first place, you add three, it goes to the fourth place, and the fourth place is D, right? And if you wanted to decrypt, you just subtract it. So if D is in the fourth place, I subtract three, and I go back to the first place, which is occupied by A. So you can see that the encryption key is three and the decryption key is minus of three. So the encryption key and the decryption key, even in the Caesar cipher, are literally the same, right? If I know one, I can find out the other. So in the second example that we did of Caesar cipher, the encryption key was six and the decryption key is minus six. So if you know the encryption key, you know the decryption key. So they're very, very closely linked. 
and of course in in the um, um, in the uh, rail fence cipher again you need to know you know which specific letter was colored differently and the same thing is used when you're decrypting so your encryption key and the decryption key are the same even there so the question is the following so suppose so in all these the knowledge of the encryption key immediately gives you the knowledge of the decryption key so here's the question i say i want to send one of you a secret message so maybe uh, rukmini who was who introduced me i want to send her a secret message and say i use some encryption method not maybe the three that i had here but one in which again the encryption key and the decryption key are very closely linked okay which means that knowing one you can find the other so i use an encryption key to encrypt my message and i send it to rukmini now rukmini has a cipher text she doesn't know what the decryption key is how do i send the decryption key to her right if i could actually because the decryption key needs to be kept secret if anybody can get hold of either the decryption key or encryption key in these encryption systems they can crack the message so it this becomes a chicken and egg situation right so the only way i could have sent something to rukmini is if we had decided much before our secret message sending that okay rukmini i'm going to use this as my encryption key so this uh you know this d which is you know basically either just e or very very closely linked to e please keep this secret so in the first place we would have to meet to exchange a secret which is the key and after that only we are able to exchange secret messages and if you couldn't meet somebody right so uh, then how do you send them the decryption key so uh, because in order to send it you have to again encrypt it and then the person who is receiving it cannot decrypt it so this is a this is a, a fundamental problem that existed in these encryption systems and um, so what do you do and here is where we come to um, you know looking at these encryption systems in a slightly different way by looking at what is happening with their keys so the, all the examples that i did before they are um, called symmetric key ciphers okay which means basically that the encryption key and the decryption key are either identical or they are so closely linked that if you know one you can find out the other okay and so the major problem that comes in these symmetric ciphers is the sender and the receiver of the sender of the message and the receiver of the message need to have pre arranged beforehand about the e and the d you know so i cannot send somebody whom i have not pre arranged things with a secret message and even if i send it they are not going to be able to uh, decrypt it so um, how what do you do if you cannot um, pre meet the person is there a way in which you can solve this and the answer is yes there is a very nice way in which you can solve this and uh, i'm going to tell you not the math solution first and i'm going to give you a puzzle so those of you who have encountered this puzzle before please don't write the answer let people think about it during the talk and then uh, maybe at the end we can discuss it so this is the physical analog of our problem i mean the solution to this uh in a way gives the mathematical solution to how uh, you can uh, exchange the encryption and decryption key in a symmetric cipher without pre arranging or without meeting okay so imagine that you are in a country where valuable items can only be sent in a locked box and which is an old fashioned locked box so it has a padlock okay you have to fix a lock on on that padlock and the other rule that the country has is that you just can't break the lock 
it's not it's not possible to break locks in this country and you have a friend who stays somewhere far away in the country and you want to send them a valuable item and this is the only method that you can use to send that valuable item it has to be put into a lock box and given to the postal service they will not accept a valuable item they will not accept it unless it's in a lock it's in a box with a lock attached to it so you send something like that the friend receives it but they can't break the lock so how do they get the valuable item so think about this and figure out what they should be doing in order to actually be able to exchange um valuable items amongst each other okay in the meantime i'll tell you about the mathematical method that came up and uh, this came up in 1976 in stanford uh, diffie Hel diffie whitfield and martin helman came up with a it was a seminal paper which they published in 1976 and um, what they came up with was a method of exchanging symmetric keys okay so you have to think about the symmetric keys as numbers now all right and uh, so there's a a number which is like an e and there's a number which is the d and they're very closely linked in the in the in that encryption system and this is a method by which you can actually come to a common key even though you are two people who are far away and once you come to that common key you can kind of use it to work your symmetric key encryption system okay so i i'm doing a lot of hand waving here and not going into the mathematical structures required to discuss um uh, how this exchange works but but i'll just mention a small fact so this is this is the thing that you need to assume right so this is like given to you what we are going to assume is that there are there is a number g which is fixed and every number that you have can be written as g to the power a for some a so if the n changes your a will change okay um and um, the 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 a of course depends on the n g is called the base and in this system the interesting thing is that suppose you know n and you know g okay so you know that n can be written as g to the power a but knowing these two things you cannot find a okay so that these are the two basic facts i want you to remember that every number can be written as g to the power something and if you know n and you of course know g even then you cannot find out what that a is easily just these two things you should remember and using this you can actually create your exchange system um this this uh, this difficulty in finding a even though you know n and you know the base g is called a discrete log problem and so you know the base g you know the number n you know that the number n is some g to the power a but you can't find the exponent a that is uh, used by knowing just n and g okay so what did diffie and helman come up with uh, in in uh, cryptography papers that are written uh, the sender is usually called alice and the receiver is called bob so what does alice do she chooses a number little a which is secret only alice knows that g is public knowledge so g is the base it's public knowledge what does alice do she calculates capital a which is g to the power little a okay now what does bob do bob chooses b which is again secret only bob knows b no one else knows b and he calculates capital b which is g raised to the power little b now what is public knowledge capital a is public knowledge capital b is public knowledge and this little g is public knowledge okay 
However, because of the facts that I've mentioned in the previous slide, even though I know capital A and little g, I can't find little a. Even though somebody might know capital B and little g, they cannot find little b. So what happens next? So this, again, as I mentioned, capital A, capital B, and G are public knowledge. However, knowing capital A, B, and G, you cannot find little a and little b. Now, what does Alice do? Because capital B is public knowledge, and she has her secret A, she just calculates B to the power A. Now, what is B to the power A? It's G to the power B to the power A, and she gets a number which she calls K. So that number K which she's got, if you actually use what was B defined as, then it is G raised to the power little b, little a. Even though she did not know little b, she's able to calculate K. Okay? And similarly, what does Bob do? Capital A is public knowledge. Little b is secret to just Bob. So he calculates capital A to the power B and finds the same number K because in the system that we have, it does not matter whether you multiply A with B in, with A first and then B second or B first and A second. So what has ended up happening is Alice and Bob have both managed to find the same number K by keeping some things secret, which are known only to each of them and other things which are put out in public, but nobody else can calculate this capital K because it is the discrete log problem tells you that even if you know capital A and capital B and you know little g, your computers or whatever else that you're using cannot crack the, in the uh, and cannot be used to find your little a and little b easily. Okay, so this system is called the Diffie-Hellman key exchange system. And it's, it's, it's very interesting because you're actually putting out things publicly, but people can't use that public knowledge to crack your system. And uh, both Alice and Bob now have a common key and that common key can be used as both the encryption key and the decryption key. So this is a system that uh, Diffie and Hellman came up in 1976. And they also came up with something else. They came up with what is called, oh, by the way, have you solved the lock box puzzle? Um, I don't know if the, if the participants can, um, this thing, but the hint is, I'm gonna give a hint here and then we'll take it up at the end. So Diffie and Hellman had a method of key exchange and the hint I will put out here is lock exchange. It's practically the answer also, but some of you can, can um, think about it if you've not already got the answer. Okay, so Diffie and Hellman in 1976 had a way in which the symmetric uh, cipher key exchange could be handled. And then they also uh, talked about something called asymmetric key ciphers. And what are asymmetric key ciphers? This is a cipher or encryption system in which the encryption key would be public knowledge, whereas the decryption key would be known only to the receiver. Please remember that encryption key and decryption key have to be linked to each other. Right, because one is, uh, you know, locking the system and the other is unlocking the system, right? So they have to be kind of inverse operations of each other. But this was a, they dreamt of a system in which you could have the encryption key, which was public knowledge. The decryption key is linked to the encryption key, but you know, it was, it, but you would still not be able to to find out the decryption key, knowing the encryption key. So this then would make things really easy, right? Because if I wanted to send Rukmini a message, all I would have to do is to find out what the encryption key for Rukmini is, use it to encrypt my message and send it off to Rukmini. 
Rukmini has the decryption key which is secret and which is only known to her. And her encryption key is known to the whole world. So anybody can send her a message, but only she can unlock that message. Okay, so that was the system that they dreamt of, but they didn't give a practical way in which such a system could actually exist. Okay, so, um, so the fact that the encryption key would be public, whereas the decryption key would be private and secret, so these asymmetric key ciphers or the encryption systems which would use this are then called public key encryption. So the concept was born in 1976. Actually, there's a twist to the tale. Apparently, the British Secret Service had discovered these things much earlier. But because they were the British Secret Service, they could not publish anything. So in terms of the uh, you know, cryptography uh, world, it's Biffy and Hellman who, who, got, uh, who, who got the kudos and, of course, the people who actually came up with the encryption system, um, which, which I'll come to just a little later. So in an asymmetric uh, encryption or a public key encryption system, basically you can imagine a phone directory with the names of people who wish to receive messages and against each of their names, you'll have an encryption key. So suppose uh, I want to send a message to Uttara, I'll just look up Uttara in the phone directory and I will see what the encryption key is in front of Uttara's name. I will use it to encrypt my message. See, in, the assumption is that the algorithm will be known to everybody. But only Uttara has the secret decryption key D which will decrypt the message and knowing E will not allow you to find D. So these kind of systems are called public key encryption systems. And the first one came up in 1977. So 76 is when Diffie Hellman write their paper. 77, three mathematicians, Adi Shamir, well, actually computer scientists, I would say. Uh, and of course, they needed the mathematics as well. Adi Shamir, Ron Drivest, and Len Adelman uh, and I've highlighted their, the initials of their surname. That's how RSA was born. So that's a public key encryption system that they came up with. And it's based on something which every single child in school uh, would have recognized. Everyone would have gone through it. It's, sim it's based on a very simple fact. You can multiply two numbers far more easily than factorize a number, right? So suppose I give you a, a P, which is 17,159, and a Q, which is 10,247, and I ask you to find the product. I mean, so it's, a, it's still, uh, you know, not easy as multiplying two with three, but it's still doable as long as you know how to multiply two numbers. On the other hand, suppose I tell you that uh, N is 17582273 and I tell you factorize N, you wouldn't even, I mean, it would be extremely difficult for you to do that. You would have to try and figure out, you know, which, uh, which uh, you know, prime number divides this. So it's not divisible by two, then you'll check whether it's divisible by three. And then five, obviously it's not, then you'll try seven. And you, you, that's the only method that you have really to see um, you know, how to factorize in. And you can see how difficult it's going to be, right? Even with a calculator, if you are trying to find out what the uh, product of prime factors for this N is, it's, it's going to be difficult. So their whole method was based on this two simple premises that it's easy to multiply but difficult to factorize. Okay? And uh, so the asymmetric trees are developed or are constructed using these kinds of two inverse operations. In our case, it is multiplication and factorization, one of which is easy and the inverse operation is very difficult to do. Okay? So before I tell you exactly how RSA works, I need to tell you uh, just a little bit about what is called clockwork arithmetic. 
So, you know, uh, we have 24 hours in the day, right? And whereas our clock has numbers from 1 to 12. So what happens if we want to talk about 1300 hours? How is that shown in the clock? It's shown with the hour hand on 1 and the minute hand on 12. So that let's just concentrate on the hour hand. The hour hand will point to 1 on the clock. On the other hand, if I wanted to talk about 1400 hours in a 24 hour system, then it would point to two on the clock. If I want to talk about 2200 hours, it's 10 on the clock. Okay, so you can see what's happening here. We are basically dividing the number by 12 and taking the remainder. Okay, so the to find the clock number, we are basically dividing the given number, say 22 by 12. And we see that uh, the remainder on dividing 22 by 12 is 10. Okay. So that's that kind of arithmetic where instead of the numbers, you work with the remi remainders that they give is called, uh, you know, modular arithmetic or arithmetic of congruences. And, um, in, we don't have to stick to 12. We can actually stick with, we can choose any positive number n. And instead of the number, instead of general numbers, we work with the remainders that we get on dividing by n. So for example, if I choose 5, my arithmetic will only involve 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Okay. And uh, so if I, instead of 64, I will work with the remainder that it leaves when we divide 64 by 5, namely 4. And we say, we state this as 64 is congruent to 4 modulo 5. Now it sounds, you know, terrible for particularly someone who's not doing maths, but all it's saying is that 5 divides 64 minus 4 or 4 is the remainder when you divide 64 by 5. Okay, and are we, so in general, if, n divides a minus b, I will write it as a is equal to b mod n. I mean, basically what you're saying is in this smaller system of just looking at the remainders, a and b are actually going to leave the same remainder on division by n. So they are equal in this new arithmetic that we are looking at, which is only going to look at the remainders that you get on division by n. So the remainders will be 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way up to n minus 1. Okay, and that's so much easier because if you if you look at natural numbers, there are infinitely many natural numbers. But if I choose an n, which is even if I choose it to be 10,000, I know then the remainders are only 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 999. Okay, so I don't have to work with all the natural numbers. I need to work with only these 10,000 numbers and the arithmetic on them also works out very nicely. And uh, what you'll see is that if, if A and B leave the same remainder on division by N and C and B also leave the same remainder on division by N, then A plus C and B plus D will leave the same remainder. So A plus C will become equal to B plus D in our new system. Similarly, AC is also equal to BD in our new system. And um, I now need to introduce a few more concepts. So this is the picture of uh, Euler, who is a mathematician who lived in this period. And there is something that we call the Euler phi function. Uh, again, it's a, it's a very simple function. It's for each number, it's, un it's counting the number of positive integers which are less than or equal to that number n and which have no factors in common with n other than one. Okay, so if I look at um, what is phi of four, what are the numbers less than or equal to four? One, two, three, and four. Now four has common factor itself with a four. Two has common factor two with four because two divides four. Whereas one and three have no factors which are common with four. Four, the only factors four has are one, two, and four. And one and three, therefore, only share one in common as a common factor with four. 
Okay, so this phi basically counts how many uh, numbers are there which are co-prime to your given number n. In a way, in your remainder system, these are going to act like primes act in your uh, natural numbers. Okay, so for example, again, another example, if you take five, then every number less than it is co-prime to it. So phi of a prime number p will be p minus one. So these are some of the properties that you have for the phi function. There's a nice formula. If you have a prime, then there are p minus one is the value of phi p. And if you take a prime power, then this is the formula that you get. And another very interesting thing is that if you know the prime decomposition of your number, you can actually calculate its phi on each of the prime powers and you can easily write down what the value of phi is. In particular, if your number is a product of two primes, then phi of, and which are distinct, then phi of PQ is P minus one into Q minus one. Um, and these are again, I mean, these are results which are dating back to the 1700s and earlier. And they are actually being used in, as I said, in 1977, they got used to create an encryption system. Okay. And you can see, I mean, these would have been regarded as results in the purest of pure mathematics. And we see that several centuries later, it is actually being applied. So this is to all administrators all over the world that please allow all kinds of knowledge to flourish and uh, you know support pure mathematics and anything, any knowledge system. You never know when they're going to be of use. So um, again, Fermat was another mathematician. Well, he was not really a mathematician, but in that time he dabbled with mathematics. He was also a lawyer and many other things. And uh, this is called Fermat's little theorem, which is different from Fermat's last theorem that many of you would have heard about. It just says the it just says that if you take a prime p and a positive number which p does not divide, say let's call it a, then if you raise a to the power p minus one, it will leave the remainder one on division by p. That's all that statement is saying. And Euler came up with a generalized version of this. See, because phi n counts the number of numbers which are co-prime to n, we saw that phi of p is p minus 1. So he's generalized it to an n. And basically, his result says that if n is a positive integer and a is any, uh, you can think natural numbers, that will also do. If n and a are natural numbers such that they have no factors in common other than one, then if you raise a to the power phi n, it will give you the remainder one on division by n. And another thing that happens is that if again a and n have no factors in common, then you can find a positive number a dash such that a and a dash when you multiply, will give the remainder one mod n. So in a way, this is like, so when you, when you look at um, uh, in our number system, when I multiply two with half, I get one. So in our arithmetic system, in our modular arithmetic system, it's saying that this A has, if, it's, if it has no factors in common with n, then it has this inverse number, which if you multiply the two together, they will be, uh, they will be like one in our modular arithmetic system. Okay, And now we come to the actual uh, method of encryption. So say this is the phone directory that we have. And I've chosen uh, the, there are N and E which are public. N has to be a product of two primes. So in Uttara's case, I've chosen two very simple primes, five and seven, to show you how this, is, this thing works. Uh, in Nilambari's case, it's still a slightly uh, more difficult number. And I leave it to you to try and break it into a product of two primes to try and factorize it. So n is a product. 
So there are two things which are made public, N and E. N is a product of two distinct primes, P and Q. N is public, but P and Q are secret. So I think someone had asked me, Raman had asked me, uh, how do you know primes play a role in cryptography? So in this RSA encryption system, um, large, very large 200 digit primes are used. So if you discover a new, very large prime uh, in, in the US, for example, that is supposed to be secret knowledge. You cannot reveal it. Um, it's, it's, uh, it comes under the military uh, rules. Okay, so, so basically what to implement this RSA system, you need an N, which is a product of two large primes. In our case, we are going to deal with 35. Uh, N is known, but P and Q, which, whose product gives you N, they are secret. And because factorization is difficult, you cannot, by knowing N, find P and Q in real time. Okay? E is the encryption key. Okay, so I'm the one who's going to create my entry in the, so Uttara. So imagine I'm Uttara, I'm creating my entry in my, in this public directory. I have picked two primes P and Q, which are secret. I've multiplied them and written down the N. Maybe you should imagine I'm Nilambari because her N is such that, um, you know, it's not easily, you can't easily think about what the P and Q are. But remember, Nilambari or I, in this case, no, I know what my P and Q are. So I know what my phi N is because phi N is nothing but P minus one into Q minus one. Okay, so I, I find out what my phi n is and I just have to choose an E which is co-prime to phi n. So often what happens is you just choose. Uh, so in, when, in Uttara's case, the primes were 5 and 7. So her phi n is uh, 4 into 6, 24. And the E has to be chosen which is co-prime to 24. Okay, so it's the easiest thing is to pick a prime which is smaller than your phi n. So in this case, uh, 11 has been picked up. The D is secret. How is the D calculated? Uttara again can calculate her D because this E is co-prime to phi n. So by the modular inverse result, there is a D such that E D will give you one when you go, when you do your division arithmetic modulo phi n. Okay, and this is also easily calculated on the computer provided you know the uh, phi n, uh, the value of phi n. Okay, please note that knowing n, you cannot find out phi n. In fact, it, finding phi n, if you know n, is the same as factorizing n. You can prove mathematically that these two things are one and the same. I'm not going into it, I'll leave that as an exercise for you to do. If you know P and Q, you know phi n. And conversely, if you know phi n, you can find P and Q. So these two things are the same. So even though n and e are public, you can't find out phi n. And therefore, you can't find out d. Only Uttara can find out her d. Okay? And what is the actual encryption method that is used? So the plain text or the message, you use some kind of translation to fix it, make it a number. Then you encrypt it using the RSA encryption. You get a ciphertext number. You can again translate, use the same translation to translate that number back to letters. And on the other hand, when you're decrypting, you start with your ciphertext, you translate it to the number, you apply the decryption you'll get the plain text number and again, you can translate it to the plain text. So here is, uh, how do you do the translation? The translation mostly is done using your, uh, the ASCII code, which assigns numbers to all keyboard characters on your computer, okay? And um, so let's see what, how exactly this happens. So if this is your uh, plain text, alphabet, it includes all the space and other keys and so on. Uh, the ASCII code assigns each of these some number. Okay, so suppose my plain text was hello. If I 
translate it using this translation, then I get a plain text number, which is 08051212215, and I'm going to call it M. And the important thing is that um, you have to break up that uh, plain text number into blocks so that each has a value less than M. Then each block is encrypted and transmitted sequentially. So suppose it was a message that had to be sent to Uttara. This was our M and her N is 35. So you have to break this into five blocks, 0, 8, 0, 5, 12, 12, and 15. So each block has value less than 35. And then you send each of the blocks separately. So what you do is you take the first block, say there were K blocks that you had. You raise each block to the power E. E was the encryption key. And you find out what the remainder is modulo N. That is your ciphertext number, okay? So knowing the ciphertext number, and that's put out publicly, knowing the ciphertext number and knowing E, you can't find MI, okay? That's not possible. And in, in, uh, in the example that we did, the first block was eight. So I have to find eight to the power 11. Now you might think that that's a very difficult thing to do, but using modular arithmetic, Basically, you find the smallest number, whether positive or negative, such that if you do 8 square minus minus 6, it's divisible by 35. So 64 plus 6 is 70, which is divisible by 35. So 8 square is the same as minus 6. So 8 to the power 4 will become minus 6 into minus 6, which is 36. But 36 is the same as 1, modulo 35. So once you've got that 8 to the power 4 is 1 mod 35, then finding 8 to the 11 is easy because 8 to the 11 is nothing but 8 to the 4 into 8 to the 4 into 8 square into 8. And you get that the final value comes out to be 22. So your ciphertext number is 22 and the corresponding ciphertext will be V. And like that, you encrypt your five blocks and you send it out, the ciphertext number and the ciphertext are known to everybody. And how does the person, that is, this is what I've sent to Uttara. So Uttara will decrypt it using her special decryption key D. Now, what was the link between E and D? E, D, D was the inverse of E mod phi, and so it gave you one, which basically means that you can write E, D as one plus some number times phi n. So when you do the cipher text raised to the power D, you're basically calculating MI to the power ED. And that is nothing but MI into MI to the power phi N, the whole raised to the power T. Now, if MI is co-prime to phi N, then automatically this part becomes, I mean, sorry, if MI is co-prime to N, then by Euler's theorem, this part inside the bracket automatically becomes one. But even if it is not co-prime to N, because N is just a product of two primes, you can show that ultimately this will this whole thing will only give you MI. And so you have recovered your original plain text. Okay, And here I've just demonstrated how when you do, uh, in this particular case, the decryption key is also just 11. Okay. Um, because ED, which is 121, is congruent to 1 mod 24. It just so happens that in this example, it's like this. But um, you read, you do this entire procedure and you will get back to H, which was 8. So um, credit card with chips uh, and your WhatsApp messages, um, all of them use public key encryption for securing transactions and messages respectively. So this is actually built in into the chip. The chip has um, like uh, uh, the, the, there's an algo, well, I mean, in the, the machine will be able to read something which is hidden in the chip, one of the keys and uh, the entire system of uh, ensuring the security is 
um, through this public key encryption. That is the encryption key and the decryption key are linked, but they knowing one will not give you the other. Okay, and WhatsApp also actually there's, uh, they use um, public key encryption along with, but to understand the kind of thing that they are using, you need to uh, understand what are called the advanced encryption systems that are used world, that's a standard which is used worldwide. And uh, in fact, I put it as um, one of the key words that you should look up. These are some of the books. The code book is meant for uh, anybody. You can read it. It's a, it's a wonderful book, which gives you uh, an idea of all kinds of encryption system, the history of it. And it also explains the maths very nicely. The others are, of course, um, maths books, which talk about uh, cryptography in more detail. And I think you should do a web search on RSA, DES, AES, Diffie and Hellman, Euler and Perma. Okay. And with this, I'll say thank you and stop. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gita, for the wonderful talk. Yeah, thank you so much. It was fascinating and gripping. <laughs> so will you take some questions now? Yes, yes. Yeah. Anupam. Yes, so I'll read out a few questions which have been already submitted. So there's a question from Chitwan. He asks, isn't the problem of not able to find A when G and N are, unknown, are known overcome by a modern computer, ah, which, are, which were not available when the method was developed? He's referring to the Diffie-Hellman uh, algo. Yes. Uh, so shall I answer that? Uh, Please, yes. Yes. Yeah. Chitwan, um, no, that's not correct. See, the um, this is something called the discrete log problem. And again, their primes play a role. Basically, um, the there is, uh, uh, for a large prime, um, there's something called a cyclic group of prime order, which is used as the uh, base, the G is the generator for that cyclic group. And in the discrete systems, uh, it's not like finding logarithm in, in real numbers. You can't do it uh, using the computers even now. I mean, in the sense that it cannot be done in real time. You will, you can crack it if you use, uh, you know, powerful computers maybe working in parallel but there is no real time algorithm even now to uh, find uh, the a the exponent a in these discrete systems thank you so uh, there is another question by varad mathur he asked in the discrete log problem wouldn't log base g of n equal to a yeah i mean you could define it to be that but it does not work like the logarithms that we have for our real numbers. So you know that um, if you choose a, a positive number as a base, okay, uh, any positive real number as a base, say G, then you know that, um, you know, every positive real number can be written as G to the power A. And in, in real numbers, you can find the A easily. You just need to use your log tables. Which you, which you learned at school, right? There's a way in which if you know that, uh, in fact, in school, we did logarithms to the base 10. So there the, uh, it made our calculations and all much. I, I mean, I don't know whether students these days do log tables, but we did it when I was in school. And what you learn is that uh, every positive real number can be written as 10 to the power. So if I take a positive real number, it can be written as, 10 to the power x. And uh, so if I, if I call the number y, y is 10 to the power x. And you can find y by just taking logs on both sides, right? And there were log tables where you can, um, you could look it up. But in the discrete system, it doesn't work that way. You, you can define a to be, um, you know, uh, 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 so, uh, log n to the base g, but you can't find a through any kind of uh, uh, you know calculations within the system easily. 
what does discrete yeah he's asked what is a discrete system it just means that uh, it's like your natural numbers um you know so it, it, the system is in sync in terms of its size to your natural or counting numbers okay real numbers are not like that real numbers if you recall if you recall the in school you drew what was called the real line right and there in that you marked 0 1 2 3 4 on the positive side and on the negative side you had minus 1 minus 2 and so on so the the natural numbers which are your counting numbers or the whole numbers which include zero and the counting numbers and integers which are uh, including the negative numbers and all they are in sync with each other in terms of size whereas the real number system it's there's a real number for in a way every point on the line and that's much much larger than um the the natural numbers and this and in the real numbers there's this concept of getting close um in a continuous manner okay so i mean i can tell you yeah it means countable countably infinite yes countably infinite or even finite is also the same so it depends on your background before i can kind of tell you uh, more yeah so uh, arundhati if you uh, would like to know more you can uh, send us the message i'll move on to the next uh, question by krishna swami uh, he is asking uh, can there be an uncrackable cipher and can it be proved uh i mean what do you mean by an uncrackable cipher the person who is encrypting the message can certainly solve it right in that sense uh in in cryptography the way you look at it is that you try and see uh how un, how uncrackable it is and that's a relative kind of uh question that you're doing so technically even rsa can be cracked if you have if you crack the problem of uh having strong computing which immediately gives you the factorization of a, a a large number right so the rsa is un quote and quote uncrackable only till the question of factorization is still very very difficult so um in most uh, encryption systems that we have currently they're all crackable it's just that it takes a lot more time than that is available because the uh, the encryption uh, is being done in an instantaneous manner whereas the cracking is going to take a much longer time and there is this belief that if you once quantum computing comes in many of these uh, problems which are uh, you know are not uh, cannot be done in real time they'll become uh, yeah so um krishna swami uh, the well there is there is a measure of the um complexity in a way right of of the uh, of any encryption system so they look at it from two points of view one is that to implement it should be easy it should not be difficult because otherwise you that encryption system can't really be used it will only be a theoretical encryption system so for a practical encryption system you need to have uh, the complexity of your input variables should not be very high on the other hand there is a way in which you can measure the the complexity of the processes that are required to break the encryption and that should be uh you know uh quite difficult okay um i mean if it, I, unless i go into uh, much more technical details this is the best that i can do um so yes there is a way of measuring uh how easy so so usually when new encryption systems come up um 
So there are people called crypt analysts. So they analyze encryption systems and they're also trying to see if there is a, a, a loophole or, you know, is the system robust? Can it be cracked in reasonable time? And they then put out, so they're like the people who, who, to whom you will present your encryption system and they're immediately testing it. And theoretically, you can study the complexity of the system. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor. So uh, next question is by Sagnik Chatterjee. He's asking, is a mixed cipher a viable option? Uh, what does he mean by a mixed cipher? One in which more than one method is being used? Is, is I, I, I think so, because he has not clarified what a mixed cipher means. Uh, yes. So a, a lot of the uh, encryption that is used uh, in daily life is mixed. So there are multiple, uh, you know, protocols which are being used uh, to create the eventual encryption system. So yes, I mean, you can do it. But see, again, as I said, uh, if you have too many different encryption systems operating across the world, that you will not be able to do your commerce, right? So what happens is that there is what is called the uh, um, digital encryption standard that they came up with, DES, which decided the basic uh, algorithms that would be used world over for certain kind of uh, functioning transactions and so on and so forth. Even within that, so even if you know the algorithm, as I've demonstrated, uh, you know, even if you know the encryption key, finding the decryption key is very difficult, right? So, so once you set up something called something like this, and now in fact, uh, what is used is the advanced encryption system, which is AES and um, the encryption is called I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. It's called Rijandel or something like that. It, 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 it is a public encryption system, which is, which came, which got uh, made by uh, Belgians. So the point is you might, whatever it is that you decide, if you're, if you're having a sequence of two or three encryption algorithms, which are working, that needs to be public knowledge in any case. So yeah, you can create mixed ciphers and they are used in that sense. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. So there's a question by Ruchi and uh, you can also read it in the chat, but I'll still read it uh, for uh, yeah. the Spartan sky tail. No, I just drew it as a hexagon. <laughs> I mean, see, the point is that if you, if you had a cylinder, uh, I mean, a perfect cylinder for a sky tail, the problem then is that uh, you will be making arbitrary horizontal lines on it, right? Uh, so, uh, Professor, so yeah, should yeah. I should I read the question because there are a few yeah, yeah, uh, attendees on the YouTube? The, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. So I can read it. So yeah, the please. question is: Does does it always dep depend on the structure? For example, in the first example, the side tail. It had uh, basically a hexagonal cylinder shape. And on what does E uh, depend on? See, so in something like the sky tail, very much the shape is extremely important. You know, that decides um, uh, the shape and the size and the dimensions of that uh, uh, thing that you're uh, using, that rod you're using determines your uh, your well your e and the d they're not i mean technically the e and the d are that side right so uh, its shape decides what the e and you know i mean so the key space in the case of the spartan sky tail technically is infinite i mean you can have many different rods of different types Right. So, but the problem is that unless everybody has the same sky tail, they're not going to be able to um, communicate with each other. Okay. So there, uh, the sky tail 
and obviously you know if you are going to wrap a leather strip around it and then write horizontally you also want that uh, uh, rod to have some flat grooves so that you can actually write otherwise you won't even be able to write so which is why uh, uh, a perfect cylinder is usually uh, not advisable but you can use any uh, any uh, it needn't be a hexagon it could be an octagon it could be anything you know? so uh, but you also need something which is easily implementable please remember that thank you thank you professor so uh, there is a question which you addressed during the talk but in case you would want to elaborate on it so uh, raman uh, asked that question could you please tell us about the link between cryptography and prime numbers uh, so in both the diffie hellman uh, key exchange as well as rsa primes are crucial and large primes at that you know so there are um, uh, as i said if you if you look up a prime database you will only find sm the small primes there the large primes in fact there is a entire exercise that there are primes called mersenne primes um, th those are numbers of a certain type which uh, often turn out to be prime and uh, so there is an entire internet search which goes on called gimp you know to to find these large primes and so on and earlier when rsa had just first come up they used to have these competitions where they would just put out an n which was a product of two very large primes and then anyone in the world could uh, or groups of people could get together using computing power to crack the n because it was known that it was a product of two big primes so uh, if you go up and look up the rsa website you will find uh, the different uh, rsa uh, ends that were given and how long it took to crack them and so on you know and there were prizes prize money given for cracking at one point great um, thank you professor so there is a very interesting question in the chat right now from shridaj i think it's uh, the exact complimentary what you were answering yeah will you read it or should i read it yeah, yeah what are the methods that do not use prime factorization problem as np problem in cracking the encryption i mean actually see i mean uh, i'm not very familiar with the practical encryption methods that are used but my guess is that many of them pretty much if it's a public key encryption kind of thing would have primes playing a role somewhere or the other but when you study uh, cryptography uh, as a discipline in mathematics um, i mean you're, you you uh, and particularly group theory you are using all kinds of groups to uh, create see all you need to have is uh two inverse processes one which is easy to calculate and the other which is difficult right so when um so you, you can do things on even infinite groups um and there are conjugacy search problems and various other things which are used but the but the fact is that i don't know how easily implementable these are right when you want to implement uh, cryptography and use it in in practice um, many of them then become uh, you know something like rsa is very easy to implement so when it comes to things like that maybe you know you would end up using um, you know the the fact that multiplication is easy and factorization is difficult but theoretically you can pick you know your uh, uh, encryption key can come out of a process which is easy to do and your decryption key which is the inverse process should be difficult that's all you need so it need not be the multiplication and factorization problem at all uh the leading algorithm in post see quantum cryptography right now we don't even know uh 
तो every now and then you have various research groups which put out news saying that they have achieved a certain level in quantum computing but it is still at a very i mean these are baby steps right now so i don't think um even in maybe in the next decade we will actually see practical quantum computing come into the picture where you know um La, a number which is a product of two very large primes can you know be cracked so but but uh, you know what is science fiction today becomes reality tomorrow so sometime in the future i i think uh, uh, these may not uh, you know the encryption systems that we have now may not work in uh, you'll have to you'll have to i guess find out what will work in quantum encryption i suppose then so uh, thank you thank you professor for this uh, uh, answer so there is a question by bhargavi she is asking is elliptic curve cryptography yeah, going yeah. to replace rsa um uh, elliptic curve cryptography has been around for quite a while now so it's uh, a i mean basically again what is being used there is that the rational points on your elliptic curves form a group so it's the question is again the group structure is what is giving rise to your encryption and uh, they found that as a good candidate for implementing um, uh, elliptic curve uh, based encryption and there are other groups also so um i as i said i mean i do not this rijindal for example i'm not very clear i haven't studied it but um it's superseded rsa in that sense at at one point rsa was the uh, was like the main digital encryption standard which was being used um, but rsa is you know it's it's easy uh, to explain it's easy for people to understand that multiplication is easy and factorization is difficult okay so um i hope that answers your query bhargavi uh somebody post uh, posted a solution yes 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 so uh, mr venkatesh has posted a solution uh, of uh, the problem that you had uh, given in, during the talk no they see the sender cannot use a padlock which belongs to the receiver because to do that you they would have to meet before and these two people have not met before hand so that's not the solution okay so so do we get the solution uh, uh see the hint i said was okay i'll give the solution out so so i lock the box and i send it to the uh to my friend who lives far away my friend can't open that box because she does not have the key to that lock right so what she does is she has a lock she puts that lock also into the same padlock and sends the box back to me i remove my lock and keep it with me and now i have a she is the the box is locked but the padlock is hers so i send the box back to her and now she can open the box so it's a lock exchange okay did, did you follow good. what i'm saying so it's like two locks are put so i put a lock first and i send it she puts her lock and now the box has two locks and she sends it back to me i remove my lock the box is still locked but with her lock now and so i can again post it without the valuable thing going out and it reaches her and it's her lock so she has the key now so it's a lock exchange and diffy helman did a key exchange you know they exchanged the the a and the b with each other capital a and the b capital b yeah yeah of course uh, uh, but uh, i didn't get i mean uh, how if it is locked uh, from uh, the other uh, person so it, so how would you this is the old fashioned tala lock you know oh, okay, okay. Uh, old fashion padlock it's not like a uh, the keyhole wala on the on the box type of thing 
you know the the old fashion where there's a lock la latch and you actually put a lock and lock uh i can show a picture if if you uh, if you can give me a second yes just, so i put a lock and i send it off to to you you got this lock box you put another lock along with this so so obviously it's a it's a box with the okay okay with the with which can take two locks so you put the lock and then you post it back to me everything is safe because it's locked i just open my lock and keep it at home and now the box is locked but with your lock so i send it back to you and you open the lock and you can take out the valuable item great great thank you thank you for the explanation yeah so i i think uh, we have addressed all the questions except i had one question in the talk you said that uh, during uh, if one is trying to find the prime numbers and gets to know about it then he should not share it uh, or make, make it public well, in actually, the us yeah the, i didn't the understand the i think it is a part of whatever their national security act or whatever it is called um, so all all such research is classified uh in fact they have an entire cyber i mean i suppose all um forces will have it uh, they have a cyber security uh, unit wing which is constantly looking at these things but if you are a if you are a mathematician doing research in such areas um i think they they get very interested in you <laughs> yeah uh thank you professor thank you for the uh, wonderful talk i must add that there were several comments saying that uh, it was a very informative and easy to understand talk so uh, there were several such comments thank you once again yeah geeta thank, thank you, you so much and for your patient uh, answering of all the questions thank you so much it was really a brilliant talk thank you thank you my pleasure thank you very much all right bye bye, bye. bye.